Hi, I'm Sue Stockdale, and welcome back to Series 15 of the Access to Inspiration podcast, where you can be inspired by people who may be unlike you. Now, if you've ever looked up at the sky at night and wondered about the stars and the planets, then today's guest knows all about this. Gary Files is an astronomer who has an immense amount of passion and was the founder of the Kielder Observatory in the UK, as well as the Grassholm Observatory where he currently works as lead astronomer. And it's widely acknowledged that these observatories' success is really due to Gary's ability to communicate that passion and enthusiasm, as well as his encyclopedic knowledge of astronomy. And I think you'll get a sense of this from our conversation today. Welcome to the podcast, Gary. It's great to speak to you today. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited and pleased to be here. One of the things I'm really interested to discover from you today, Gary, is the difference between an astronomer and an astrophysicist. How would you define those two words? It's a bit tricky, actually. How I would describe it really would be that if you were an astronomer, it would be sort of an overarching description of somebody who works in the field of astronomy. I think an astrophysicist, if he was taught to his mates in the pub, would describe himself as an astronomer. But professionally, you'd describe yourself as an astrophysicist, I guess. If you want to get into the nitty-gritty, astronomy would be the overarching term. And astrophysics would be the nitty-gritty of the bits and pieces that we do, which encompasses physics in its real sort of raw-blooded form, which is in the physics of the universe. Because, you know, in every sense, the universe is like a big old laboratory. That's the way to think about it, I guess. So what initially sparked your interest? in the skies above us, Gary? Well, my interest peaked when I was a young kid, I guess, when a couple of things happened. Once, an older brother of mine, he got a small refracting telescope for Christmas, wasn't particularly interested in it. I was, messed around with it and got it to work, pointed it at the moon, and I can sort of see an image in my mind's eye, but I was probably about five or six years old. So I think that image, if I could sort of relay it now and transport it so everybody could see what I saw then, it wouldn't look anything like the moon, I would guess, because it would have been out of focus. But that was my first memory. After that would have been my dad, who took me on holiday down into Devon, and I got to see the Milky Way for the first time. The moon observation, I was probably about five, the Milky Way thing, probably six or seven. And that was it. When I saw the Milky Way, that was it. I was hooked. I was like, what the hell is that? Right? (laughs) For most of us at that age, and in those days, perhaps, all we thought a Milky Way was, was a chocolate bar. Yeah, I mean, I, I think then, I don't even think Milky Way's as chocolate bars were even around. Maybe there were. I, certainly, I didn't used to get them. But I mean, yes, you're right. And you know, as you were a kid, you, you're used to seeing everyday boundaries that you come across in the world, like your, your parents, your home, where you live, your school, and all the rest of it. But then I think that the thing that hit me then was there's more. There's something else out there that is not this, and it's not that. And it just made something inside me click, I guess. So how did you then follow that passion? What was it that really drew you to then discover more about that and to make it your passion and your livelihood, I guess, these days? Yeah, I guess I invented my own reality in lots of ways. I've had a really weird career in astronomy, how I got, how I got to where I am, little doubt about that. And I think looking back, it was a fascination for the things I've just described. And then as I started to get older, I wasn't fortunate enough, I guess, maybe is the word. I wasn't surrounded by an environment, let's just say, which encouraged kids my age to think about working in science and to think about the world being a world of possibilities, which it absolutely is. I firmly believe that. The world I lived in then, growing up in Sunderland, a working class family, working class area, and as especially as a little boy, you were destined to be a little scrapper to stay alive. And, you know, then you were sort of channeled towards working in the military, the shipyards, building sites, or some sort of manual job like that. So I studied astronomy and I read books on astronomy and got really excited about it. In exactly the same way I meet children today in my professional career getting excited about astronomy. It just wasn't like what it is now then, I guess. And Well, it wasn't for me. It was like a sort of a, a guilty pleasure, a hidden thing, I guess. I used to keep it to myself. It was mine. What happened next? How did you then go from that guilty pleasure to making it your career? Well, well, sort of life just got a hold of me, I guess. And I remember the school I went to, they were running a bus to the college, a nearby college. And it was for all the guys who were going to go off and learn manual skills like joinery, carpentry, brickwork, plastering, metal. And I'm getting on the bus, right? And I'm like 14 or something. And I'm getting on the bus. I remember physics teacher saying, Gary, 
where on earth are you? You're not getting on that bus. And I actually did end up on that bus. And I ended up with a family at a really quite quite a young age. And then life just got a hold of me and, it, and my priorities changed. And sixth form was an option, but I was like, I just wanted to get out and work. I needed to. And then I ended up on a building site for a while and I ended up building sites for quite a while. And then in the late 30s, early 40s, I decided I need to change my life completely. During this period of time, I was constantly studying astronomy and physics, and I was keeping my brain alive by engaging myself with my studies, literally with books, and, but nothing really practical. And then in the early 40s, I guess, late 30s, I got involved with the Southern Astronomical Society, and then I started to use what I'd learned with the Southern Astronomical Society and started just being around like-minded people who seemed to have a real flair for astronomy like I did. And then I thought, you know what, this is my calling. It just felt like in the spirit and the soul that this is what I should be doing. This is where I belonged. And I'd missed it from a kid. And I should have maybe found a way to make it happen. If I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have got on that bus at all. I would have stayed in and studying. And I'm pretty sure I know where I would have been now. So that's really interesting. And how did you get involved up at Kilder? One thing led to another. I met a guy called David Sindon. David was the chief optical engineer for Acro Parsons. And they made the William Herschel Telescope, for example, which is part of the Isaac Newton Group on La Palma now. David took me up to the dark skies of Northumberland, where I got introduced to the Kielder Forest area. And the skies were phenomenal. And I thought that was pretty amazing. And then I decided I wanted to build an observatory. So I did. Around right about at the same time, I got involved with Durham University. And that's when it all really started, I guess, because Durham University had just been my saviour, really. They're just amazing. The guys at Durham, I hold them so highly. And what a wonderful facility and a wonderful university. And the people there are just the best, especially in the physics department. They're the only ones I know there. I met a guy there at Durham University, Dr. Nigel Metcalf. And this was sort of, gosh, when was that? That would have been like 25 years ago, I guess. I just started turning up and asking lots of questions and Nigel was getting involved with me with the observatory and keep me steered in the right direction. And, and then I just started meeting all the team. I learned through osmosis and I started turning up at the university more and more and more and more and more. And then I would sit in on lectures and I would do all sorts of quizzing of PhD students. And there I was just like a permanent fixture. And I think they just would have seen me in the physics department and thought, oh, he's Gary's here again. And I just thought they must have thought I was just some sort of weirdo or something. And then I, I got really friendly with a guy called Arnold Wolfendale, Professor Sir Arnold Wolfendale, who was the 14th Astronomer Royal. And he took me under his wing, quite literally, really. And then I started to learn all sorts of stuff. The observatory started to take off. And then in 2012, they awarded me a master's degree in astrophysics from Durham University, which was just amazing for all my contributions to astronomy. And then I opened the Kielder Observatory in 2008. And then that just went pretty mental, really. And I ended up working there full time. I got published in 2016, received a fellowship from Sunderland University in 2017, and just started working in outreach and astronomy, really, and trying as best as I could to study all the time. But the people I met worked all over the world, visited some of the biggest observatories around the world as well, and met some amazing people, asked the questions I needed answers for, and ended up giving talks at Cambridge University, Durham University, all around the world. And it's just been an amazing journey, really, I guess. Well, sometimes the road less travelled gives us different experiences and insights along the way. I just love how you put into the conversation there, Gary. And then I just created an observatory, as if it's like building a garden shed. And so I want to dig a little bit more into that in terms of what does it take to build or create an observatory there in Kielder Forest? Whoa, partnership, bloody mindedness and, you know, just like a real determination and a passion for it to succeed, I guess. And I knew there was an appetite for astronomy amongst the public and I was just determined to build something. And I set about trying to raise the money for it. And it was pretty difficult because this was like shortly after the millennium and it was like there wasn't a lot of dosh sloshing around. So I had to really try hard. And then it got on the radar of a few people who helped me raise the money and some great collaborations with the Forestry Commission, for example, and the Kill the partnership, and then we raised £450,000 to build the observatory. Started a, a competition with Reba, Royal Institute of British Architects, to design the facility, and then they installed me as the astronomical advisor on the project. And then I was the lead astronomer at the observatory in the observatory in 2008. Then I was promoted to the director. 
Then I was the chief executive as well later on in sort of 2017-ish, something like that. Yeah, so it was quite a rise really, but it was, it's been quite a journey. <laughs> well, it sounds like it. And what does astronomy do for society? I can hear your passion and your energy and your commitment to share that knowledge with us. I guess the underlying question is why? Ooh. Well, I mean, I think to answer the first part of your question would be the easier bit, I guess. And I guess the question sort of hinges around why astronomy matters. And I do get asked this question. I've had people at the observatory, for example, underneath a wonderful clear night, beautiful stars and, and all the rest of it, and really big research-grade telescopes. And people say, what's the point of this? Well, we're never going to be able to go to these places and you show the galaxies at cosmological distance, for example, and they say things like, well, why does it matter? And you know what? That, that's a legitimate question to ask. But in lots of ways, it's like almost I would ask the question back to people is like, why would you want to even ask that question? Because I think science, especially in physics and astrophysics and theoretical physics, is to try to find out the true nature of reality. And I think is not just a job for science. I think, and my co colleagues are going to hate me when I say this, it's a job for philosophy in that as well. And a job for religion in there as well. And I'm not a religious person at all, not in any way, shape or form. But I think the epistemology around conversations about the true nature of reality are important and you have to engage everybody in that because we are human beings and we do things our way and we have to build all these mechanisms, I guess, into the answer. But the answer for me, asking why does astronomy matter, is because it's a source of everything, right? And if we look at it from the astronomical and scientific perspective, we've now found, for example, all of the bases for ribonucleic acid and deoxyribonucleic acid in meteorites. So all you need after that is sugars and phosphates, a lot of the right conditions, and a bit Darwinism, and you have the entire genetic code for all life on Earth. So you can think of meteorites as like space bees, right? They're just buzzing around with all the bits and pieces needed to build and support everything we can see, touch and feel in the universe. And then you think about stars and star formation, and we think about stars like our sun cooking up the elements through nuclear fusion in the cores, and then these stars die off. And this is how you distribute the elements into stellar space, only for new stars to sweep them all up and build solar systems in the future, and life gets going. And then then you think about, well, all right, then you've got that, and that's a big thing. That's a conversation and a, a real awakening that science has given us. So you, from a reductionist standpoint, you can see why that's important. And then you think about, well, what about life here on Earth? And I think that's where these questions really originate from. When you think about the development of the instruments we used in astrophysics and in exploring the universe, then think about the internet, for example, Tim Berners-Lee worked at CERN, right? And he did develop the World Wide Web. Everybody likes the World Wide Web. Some people don't, but it's useful. And then we think about the tools that have came because of physics like MRI machines, X-ray machines and all the rest, but then it's important. But I think the real fundamental basis and the basic point is if to me human beings are actually going to succeed in this world and we are going to sort of climb out of this technological adolescence where we stumble through our existence with making the rich richer and the poor poor and the and the adversity that some human beings have to live under currently that has to change and it will change if we can stay around long enough and if we can climb out of that and we evolve into a more into a more caring cultured society where we have this real equity amongst all human beings where everybody benefits and where everybody's important and i think what will be a massive massive part of that structure almost like in a in orderly huxley style brave new world version astronomy would be front and center our awareness of our place in the universe and our awareness that, you know what, we're part of something amazing and we need to embrace that. And we need to make sure that we infuse and inspire every single child that ever breathes on this planet, what we're part of and where we are right now in the universe and our awareness of where we are. That's the part astronomy plays because it is an inspiration beyond the technological. It's an inspiration of the spiritual as well. And I think would realize that spiritually we're probably part of a huge family of civilizations out there. Some of which we might not want to get to know, but a lot of which I get, I bet we probably would. Sorry if, if that was a long-winded answer, but it sort of really does encompass everything. And, and why do I want to do it? Why am I passionate about it? Why does it matter to me? You know, in lots of ways, Sue had saved my life astronomy and, and it gave me purpose in life. And I think all human beings need to feel that. 
I love how you've just connected the bigger system, the whole universe that we are part of, into the act of looking up at the sky and engaging your passion. And that it goes for me from the very massive to the very tiny and seeing the connectedness between both things and that it matters to you. You talked there about it saved your life and that it's your purpose. And you've expressed that enthusiasm that you have for your subject. I'm wondering how could you help other people to access their inspiration? What would be the sort of top tips you would share or your insights you've learned? I remember engaging a little bit with philosophy and a little bit with mindfulness. I think for me, and I don't know if this would work for everyone, but like you asked me, so I guess I'll answer it, it is like, is to turn your thinking brain off and feel it. And if it feels in your very soul and that this is the right thing for me, then go for it. I've got four kids. Well, they're all adults now. They're all professional people. Some are academics, others are not. And they're all the professional lives. And what I always said, the children when they're growing up is just push your life in the direction you want to go in and the bits and pieces will take care of themselves but you've got to feel that passion about your life every day because it doesn't last forever so I think to me would be to turn the thinking brain off and feel it and if it feels right do it and don't stop. It's such a lovely simple and powerful description you've given us there Gary. How much did passion play a role in you getting the funding for the observatory and for the work that you have done over the years? I think it's played a really big part because I had to sell the idea quite literally to people who were interested in the project. When we were raising funds for the Kielder Observatory, I was interviewed on a few occasions by various different funding bodies as to the legitimacy of something like an astronaut observatory in the Kielder Forest. I had to tell people or sell the idea of astronomy, why it's so important, why if we funded and built something like an observatory for members of the public to attend, you are providing a service for society that is essential. You would be enabling people to access a part of their lives that they can't in any other way. And for example, people do now have telescopes by gods, that's always been the case. That to do collectively, so if you get like 30 or 40 people in the same building on a beautiful starry evening and you get this sort of talk and think about astronomy, it's a collective thing as well. So it's, I think that's really powerful. If you're doing it on your own, it's amazing. And I've had some great experiences under the stars just by myself, just standing into the wilderness, right? But when you do it collectively, I remember thinking like human beings are like relationship seeking missiles, aren't we? We can't survive without relationships. So I think, you know, being able to collectively stargaze and just look out in the depths of the universe and share experiences as a group and, and listen to what other people think of that. Because quite often you'll get people who like literally blow a fuse when they see things through a telescope. It's like, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe it. I remember one story. One lady came to the observatory up in Kiel the Forest. This was 2012, 2013. She was quite elderly and she looked at the planet Saturn. Now at this time, Saturn was in Gemini. So it's really high up in the sky. So we could see the rings of Saturn tilted towards us. So you could just see this absolutely gobsmacking view of the planet Saturn. I mean, it was absolutely beautiful, right? And this lady had seen it and she started to cry and she got very emotional. And I thought, this is a lovely response. And so I quizzed her on it late and I said, that seemed like it was a quite an emotional experience. Would you mind if I asked you what was the trigger and what caused that? And she told me that when she was a child and she was easily in her 80s, she said when she was in the air raid shelters, when she was a child, her father would draw the planets and her favorite planet was Saturn. And that was the first time she'd saw it for herself. So I thought that was amazing. Wow. It's like experiences like that, which is priceless. Wow. I've got goosebumps listening to your story there, Gary, just to get a sense of how important that can be for people and how connecting really in the heart, as you said, not just in the head. I want to just turn our attention to the question of dark skies, because that's something that's disappearing fast from what I understand. Is that right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think with the spread of light pollution in all the cities, there's more human beings and they put more lights outside and more supermarkets and car parks and highways. So the light pollution is absolutely increasing. There's a little bit of a problem in the, in the awareness of most members of the public about outdoor lighting and what really works and what really doesn't at all. So our ability to see the nighttime sky is a human right in my eyes. And it's been taken away from us because of the onset of how we, as human beings, ably demonstrate our ability to do things badly. And I think the way we light up the nighttime sky is a great example of this. 
But I'm hopeful, you know, that that will change and that the preservation of dark skies will become more and more important. And this is why one of the real big motivators for me with the Kielder Observatory, the Grass Home Observatory where I work now, which is just a wonderful facility, that we can provide these little stargazing havens for people to come under beautiful dark skies and access the universe. And that's their primary purpose, these small little observatories that people, you know, and there's lots of them all over the country now, and that's great. Right, that can only be a good thing. But dark skies are so important. And when I went off to Chile and made Searching for Light, the documentary, this award-winning documentary, the nighttime skies in Chile are magnificent. I mean, wowza. And it's because there's big deserts there, right? Like the Atacama, for example. But in Chile, they've actually written it into planning law and a law about the preservation of the dark skies. And what we do believe is by 2030, 75% of the world's largest aperture telescopes will be in Chile, in the Atacama Desert. So they've got the Chilean government really invested in preserving. I just wish we were. Given your enthusiasm and passion that's enabled you to build and create an observatory, could you turn that energy into the selling of dark skies at a national level? Yes, absolutely. I think I absolutely could. And I would like to be able to do that. It's about making people listen. And the, and the unfortunate byproduct of the world we live in is like dark skies, do they produce, are they viable? Do they produce is there a net worth for dark skies? Well, there absolutely is. And if we have to sell it that way, let's sell it that way. Because in 2013, Northumberland were awarded the Northumberland International Dark Sky Park Award. Now, when I first thought about this idea of the International Dark Sky Park, it was met with quite a few furrowed brows and raised eyebrows. And people were like, what? What's this? What do you mean, Gary? It was one thing, building an observatory, but you talk about controlling people's light and forcing them to turn the light off. Dark sky park was like, it was the running for the hills. But now, of course, the International Dark Sky Park, from a tourism perspective, is massive, right? And I think it has to be woven into the technology of a forward thing in civilization, where if we hooked into the financial markets and money this and money that, and that's one thing, right? And it seems to be that's just what we're stuck with for the near future. It's just going to be the way it is. But it would be remiss of the policymakers not to watch the bottom end of all of this and think, well, as well as doing all that, let's divert some of this finance into making sure that people can engage in what they want to do and what they are engaged in. And astronomy should be front and centre in all of that. Astronomy is an accessible, holistic, natural resource that we should all have our eyes open up to. And in the long game, if you think about it, in the long game for UK PLC, if you like, then why would you not want to inspire innovators of the future? And these young kids who might end up, I don't know, doing whatever, if you give them the chance to think about how they could innovate in the future, then you have no idea who you're going to inspire and enthuse for, for UK PLC. So I think dark skies could absolutely be the catalyst for that. It's lovely to hear your energy um, to express what possibilities there could be by having more dark skies around us, or even just entering it into our cognizance that there is an importance and a value to having dark skies in the different parts of the world, wherever the listener is located. If somebody is listening to this podcast, Gary, and they're inspired by what you're saying, and they want to take the first steps into understanding more about astronomy, just as you did when you were younger, what would you suggest would be a route to go from here? So if it's a young person, I think the first thing I would say to people is buy a telescope. If you've got a small child or a child who's shown an interest, show them a telescope. Because the passion and the love for astronomy will fuel their education and the curiosity. And you can buy small telescopes and you can look at the planets and you can look at the moon and you can get excited and you can understand that. Start from the basics, you know, get a star chart and look at the sky and say, look at the stars, even with the moon in it. And one of the first observations you will make is you cannot tell if the moon is in the foreground or the stars are. I mean, that's a great place to start. Conventional wisdom tells us that the moon is in the foreground and the stars are way off behind it, but you can't see it like that. So that's an interesting starting point for a beginner just to step outside and look at the sky and think, oh, yeah, absolutely true. This, of course, is what led early astrologers like Ptolemy, for example, Aristotle, Plato, or Eratosthenes. All of the ancient Ionians looked at the sky and realized that all of the stars seem to be fixed and stationary and at the same distance. But they're not because we can measure distance now and it's not arranged like that at all. So that's a good one to start off with. You can even question things like, I don't know, what's another good one? Like the Copernican idea, this Copernicus, of course, postulated that we did not have an Earth-centered solar system or a universe, as they call it. 
it was a sun-centered universe or a heliocentric universe. So most people, it was actually Galileo who proved that theory. And so the Copernican theory is the right one, that the sun's at the center of the solar system. Okay, well, test that then. Get outside, and any summer's morning when the sun is rising, you'll see the sun will rise in the east, and then it'll set in the west, and then 24 hours later, it's in the east again. All right, what's the conclusion then? Well, the conclusion is it doesn't look anything like that we are moving around it. It looks everything like it's moving around us. So that's an interesting observation just to get the curiosity peaked, I guess. And then, you know, then you can try to work out what's going on. You realize the Earth is spinning on its axis and all the rest of it. And so it gets really interesting very quickly. If you have a child, the young person, who's interested in a career in astronomy and really showing flair for mathematics and physics, don't buy them a telescope. You're not wasting your time, but it's not the need. Get them coding, get them to learn how to code, understand AI, get them to build websites, get them to build spreadsheets and get them used to a computer because that's the future and that's what they need, not a telescope. What pragmatism to your answer, Gary. Yeah. If we were to fast forward a few years into your life, what would you hope that your contribution will be to this world of astronomy? Oh, you know, I think starting off these astronomy centers, these astron observatories that I thought up and I got them run up and running, that's my achievement, that's my calling, I did it. And where everybody else said it couldn't be done and it wouldn't work, I did it and it worked and I'm really proud of that. And I think the more of these little facilities that I can be part of, and I'm not finished yet, I've just started off a new one a couple of years ago and it's flying. Uh, which is the Grass Home Observatory in Middleton in Teesdale, and it's absolutely wonderful. And it's where I'm off to after this, got a sold-out event tonight, and it's beautiful outside, so we're really looking forward to that. So I think, yeah, just if I can inspire people to look up and think about the place in the universe and think about, think about what's out there, right? You know, the observable universe has two trillion galaxies in it, right? And each one of those galaxies full of hundreds of billions of stars like our sun, and the majority of them will have planets, I mean, that realization alone should stir you in your seat and you should think, wow, looking out into that universe and we're just one tiny little world spinning around an ordinary planet. That realization, why why would you not want to find out what's out there? Because it's like when you get a telescope, because the universe, we can't go there yet. Maybe one day we can. All we do is look at it. Right. And, and like light is the messenger of the universe, as I always say to people. And we're like we're standing in our back garden, Sue, and there's a fence right at our waist. There's a fence. And beyond the fence, it's fast and goes on forever. And we can't go in. It's like a magic garden that we can't go into. But all we can do is with our binoculars and our telescopes, look to see what's over the horizon, hopefully, and see what's inside of it. And that's the fascination. And that realization is just, it should put a smiley face every morning you wake up to think about what we're part of, right? And I guess if my contribution could be just with a few people, make them realize that bit, then I'll be happy. Well, you've certainly put a smile on my face in our conversation today, Gary. I think your energy and enthusiasm is infectious. I think your ability to translate what for some might seem scientific, difficult to understand, complicated. What you've shared with us in the last few minutes has really made it accessible and I'm sure it will inspire our listeners. So um, thank you so much for your time today. If people do want to find out more about you and the work that you're doing, how might they do that? Well, they can check me out on my website, which is garyfiles.org. On there, I've got quite a lot of information. All my contact details are on that. Or they can check out the observatory where I'm working currently, which is the Grass Home Observatory, which is www.grasshomeobservatory.com. And they can check out the facility where I work. It is a public observatory, so you're welcome to come along and visit and see me up there. It's a beautiful part of the world. And as I always say, we always get a disproportionate amount of clear skies. So there's lots of clear skies to enjoy. And it's a wonderful facility with great kit. Fantastic. Well, we'll put links to all of those things onto the show notes so people can find out more there. Thank you again for your time today, Gary, and I wish you well. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Gary and felt that passion as I did. Now, remember, you can find transcriptions for this and more than 100 other episodes on our website at accesstoinspiration.org. And you can keep connected to us via social media. We're on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. So just look out for Access to Inspiration. Next week, my guest is Kevin Chapman, who will be talking to me about the concept of physical intelligence. So I hope you can join us then.